chapter 11 p2 in this lesson and you're going to be bringing together some of the ideas that you've looked at when studying exposure and storm on the island into a form of comparison the comparative element is a crucial part of the exam because for the poetry question you will be asked to compare two of the poems from the anthology the question we're looking at today is compare how the power of nature is presented in exposure and storm on the island. In the exam itself, only one of the poems will be named and printed for you, and you will get to choose the other poem um, to, to which you're comparing it. Um, but on this occasion, we're going to name both poems because these are the last two poems that you've studied. One thing to note is that you should be trying to compare ideas not methods. You may compare methods from the two poems, but it should be the comparison of ideas that drives your paragraph. Ideally, in your essay, you would identify three separate comparisons. You're not going to do a full essay today, but that's just um, a note for future reference. For each of your ideas, you're either going to have one piece of evidence which allows you to do significant detail of analysis or you're going to need to choose two pieces of evidence that enable you to build up your layers of analysis and hopefully that will become clear when you look at the example I've written later on because it's detailed analysis of evidence that is really the, the thing that's going to elevate your mark for this question. I'm going to go through three potential ideas and I would advise that you take notes for each of these slides because you're going to be asked to write your own comparison at the end of this video. And so the more notes you have, the better prepared you're going to be to write that comparison. If you don't have any notes at all, you're going to be very much on your own looking at the poems in isolation. So the first um, thing I'm going to look at is the way the power of nature is presented at the start of both poems. If we think about exposure first and the opening line, our brains ache in the merciless iced east winds that nive us, a brilliant line from Owen that offers so much opportunity for analysis. The first thing we can consider is the use of the collective pronoun our because it confirms to us that the men the soldiers in the trench are united by something and in this case they are united in their suffering and it is suffering that has been caused by the power of nature not by the german enemy the use of brains instead of heads is an interesting one because it confirms to us that the suffering that is caused by the power of nature is an internal one. It is, it is no longer confined to the external and the suffering has perhaps gone so deep that it has become psychological as well as physical. There's a brilliant use of sibilance, the repetition of the S sound in this opening line, particularly in merciless iced east winds. And it's a, a technique that carries on throughout the first stanza. The sibilance in many ways mimics the sound of the wind and it allows the reader just a brief insight into the conditions that the men faced. But actually it's very clever by Owen because although it makes us feel like we can experience the sound of the wind like the soldiers did, in reality we are so far away from understanding the brutality of that experience that it makes us appreciate their suffering even more. It also gives the wind a sinister effect as well. There's a softness to the sibilance and in that softness it makes the brutality of the wind even more sinister and savage and that idea is intensified in the personification of the final two words of this opening line which is nivus. And that gives nature not just a brutality and a power, but also an intent. It makes the suffering seem deliberate. It gives the weather motive uh, and that makes it more brutal and more sinister than it could have been without that word. 
let's think about the comparison with Storm on the Island and how the power of nature is presented at the start of the poem. And these are the opening lines. We are prepared. We build our houses squat, sink walls in rock and roof them in good slate. Like with exposure, the poem opens with a collective pronoun and that collective pronoun is repeated. So we know that the speaker in this poem feels united with other people. But the difference here is whilst they are united in their respect for the power of nature, they are not united in their suffering. Instead, they appear to be united in the comfort of their togetherness because we get the sibilance of squat and sink and then the fricative consonants of rock and roof and the assonance of roof and good, all of which gives those opening lines a softness which presents to us a feeling of comfort and security. So whilst both poems reveal nature's power, they reveal a respect for nature's power. The difference is that in exposure, there is an extremity of suffering and pain. But in Storm on the Island, there is a preparation. There is an acceptance of nature's power and a togetherness in preparing for it and fighting against it. I'll pause a moment just to give you an opportunity to to clarify your notes and um, whoever's running this lesson might choose to pause the video at this point um, just to give you a minute or two to, to make your notes before we move on. The second idea that um, I want to consider is the notion of nature as a disruptive force and that disruption coming in the idea that it is unorthodox and it is unexpected. It cannot be predicted and that is what makes it so terrifying. In exposure we are told in the third stanza we are referenced the poignant misery of dawn begins to grow and then we learn that the dawn is massing in the east her melancholy army which attacks once more in ranks on shivering ranks of grey. The way the dawn is presented here is particularly interesting. It's described as the misery of dawn. If we consider the connotations of dawn as we normally know it, those connotations are of hope, of new beginnings, of positivity of aspiration, but here dawn only brings pain and suffering, and that is because of the inevitability of nature's power to destroy and to disrupt. And then we get the dawn massing in the east, her melancholy army. The personification of dawn here adds more sinister intent to nature's power. To the point, actually, that the weather becomes a greater enemy than the German soldiers in the trenches opposite, which is confirmed in that next line when it says that dawn attacks once more in ranks on shivering ranks of grey. The use of words in the semantic field of war confirms nature's brutality, power and savagery. And the repetition of the word ranks suggests to us not only the inevitability, but also the relentlessness of the power of nature. It seems at this point in the poem that there is no stopping it, that it cannot be prevented, it cannot be fought. Let's think about Storm on the Island now then. And we have um, in the second half of the poem, you might think that the sea is company exploding comfortably down on the cliffs, but no, when it begins, the flung spray hits the very windows, spits like a tame cat turned savage. First of all, we get words in the semantic field of 
warfare again with exploding exploding but it's contradicted slightly in the oxymoron the idea that it is exploding comfortably but in many ways that oxymoron actually gives nature a greater threat because it's doing the damage so easily and without effort the use of enjambement is significant here whereas in exposure the sense of relentlessness comes in the repetition of ranks. Here, the sense of relentlessness comes in the enjambement from cliffs into but no, from hits into the very windows, and then the tame cat turns savage. That enjambement suggests that this power is ongoing. It is relentless. It is unstoppable. Unlike in exposure, nature's threat and the fear of nature comes in the fact that it is unexpected, it cannot be predicted, because in that simile, spits like a tame cat turned savage. We get this notion that something which seems predictable can suddenly fly out of control. And it's that lack of predictability in Storm on the Island that gives nature um, its sinister threat and its power. Once again, if you if you need to pause the video at this point to to clarify your notes for a moment, please do. And the final idea which we're going to consider are in the conclusion of this battle between man and nature. And we'll look at the endings of both poems. We'll start with the final stanza of exposure. And I've not listed it all here, but um, bits that I consider significant. Tonight, this mud will fasten on this frost and us, shriveling many hands, puckering foreheads crisp. And then we're told that the burying party pours over half known faces. All their eyes are ice, but nothing happens. The use of um, the fricative consonants is really powerful here. Fasten on this frost and us. The mixture of the fricative F and the sibilance in the S gives the line a really soft feel. But that softness only lends nature a really sinister vibe, a really sinister feeling, as if um, nature is acting within itself in order to cause this pain and suffering. And then the really menacing word, puckering, because puckering is associated with kissing. So it gives nature this almost tender quality at the same time that it is killing these men. And it's almost as if the power of nature has become so overwhelming and so destructive that actually the death of these men is almost a release. There's a softness in the death of these men because it is a final release from the suffering that they've endured at the hands of nature. I think the reference to half known faces is interesting because there's an, an anonymity to the men. Um, it's almost as if nature has destroyed them, has removed their humanity, has removed their individuality. And the use of caesura in and an end stop in that line we get the medial caesura after faces and an end stop after ice it gives nature's power a finality it makes it seem as if there is no coming back from its destructive quality and that is confirmed in the final use of the refrain but nothing happens there is no avoidance of nature's power no one is going to save them from it. In some ways, the ending of Storm on the Island is similar and we get an intensification of nature's power. We just sit tight while the wind dives and strafes invisibly. Space is a salvo. We are bombarded by the empty air. Strange, it is a huge nothing that we fear. Because like earlier on in exposure, we get the use of the semantic field of war in dives and strafes and salvo and bombarded. But every time a word in the semantic field is 
used. It's undermined to a degree because the strafing is invisible. The salvo is an empty space. The bombardment is by the empty air. And that juxtaposition is picked up again in the final line. It is a huge nothing that we fear. And the oxymoronic nature of that final phrase, huge nothing, can be taken in two ways. Either you can see it as a realisation by man that they have nothing to fear in the form of nature, or you can see it that nature becomes particularly menacing at this point because it cannot be identified and things which cannot be identified or quantified are particularly sinister, menacing and threatening. I also think the use of caesura, there's more caesura in this, an end stop in this final section than there is in the rest of the poem. In line two, we get the medial caesura and the end stop. We get the end stop after um, the end of the penultimate line and when we, we get the caesura after strange. If it's either that nature's power is final, like it is in exposure, or it could be that man is establishing a sense of control in this poem that they entirely lack in Owen's poem, Exposure. So I think Storm on the Island is a much more ambiguous ending than Exposure and can be read that there's an equality in this battle, whereas in Owen's poem, there is an absolute finality that nature has gained control and won this war. What I'm going to do now is um, show you and talk through an example of a comparison and I'll talk through the choices that I've made because you're then going to write your own comparison using different examples to this. I'll read it first and, and then I'll, I'll talk about it as, as I'm going. So in exposure, Wilfred Owen presents the power of nature as something to be utterly feared. Likewise, Heaney and Storm on the Island presents nature as a destructive force but there is a respect for its power more than an absolute fear. So what you can do in your opening comparison is you can draw, you can draw similarities, but even within those similarities, you can often find differences. But you're looking to set up your comparison at the start of the paragraph. And now I'm going to deal with exposure. At the opening of exposure, Owen highlights the pain that nature can cause. When the speaker declares that our brains ache, the use of the collective pronoun introduces the idea that the men are united in their suffering. Furthermore, the choice of brains instead of heads confirms this suffering is deep. It goes beyond the external and has become psychological too. Moreover, in the reference to the merciless iced east winds, Owen's use of sibilance mirrors the sound of the wind, almost allowing the reader an insight into the conditions. But the softness of the fricative sounds lends nature a sinister threat, which is intensified through the personification in Nivus. Hopefully you can see there that in a single line of evidence, I am building up several layers of analysis. If I didn't have that detail of analysis, I would need to be adding additional quotations to allow me to do that. Hopefully you've also noticed the focus, focus on writers' methods here. Whether I'm identifying techniques like collective pronouns, sibilance, fricatives and personification, or whether I'm picking out key words such as brains, there's a focus on the choices that the writer is making and the effects that they create. I'll move on to the comparison. And it starts with a comparative connective, like however. That could be in contrast, it could be similarly, it could be likewise, depending on what your comparison is. In this case, it seems that um, I'm gonna set up a difference. However, in Storm on the Island, whilst there is clearly a respect for nature's power, there is also a confidence in the tone of the speaker, which is entirely lacking in exposure. In the opening line, we are prepared. The use of the collective pronoun unites the people as in exposure, but this time they are united in their respect for nature and also in their collective strength. This sense of togetherness is reinforced when the speaker declares that they sink walls in rock and roof them in good slate. 
Heaney's combination of fricatives and assonance gives the line a soft feel to emphasise the comfort the speaker is the speaker feels despite a clear acknowledgement of nature's power. Same process here as for the previous paragraph where I'm looking at technique and key words and effect. I'm looking to build up layers of analysis. But hopefully you've also noticed that I don't leave the first poem behind. There are a couple of occasions here where I'm looking to clarify the comparison with exposure. I don't entirely forget exposure in my second paragraph. OK, your um, job now is to write your own comparative paragraph using different evidence to that which I have used in my example. And here are three potential paragraph starters which set up your comparison. And um, you're welcome to leave these on the screen so that you can use them. But there are three, three potential ideas. What you will need to do is identify first the one or two quotations from each poem that are going to allow you to do your analysis, identify the keywords and identify the techniques. And then you can write your comparative paragraph. You can start it off by setting up the comparison here. Then you can do your analysis of exposure. Then you can do your analysis of storm on the island. And in your second paragraph, don't forget to maintain that comparison. Don't leave the first poem behind. So your success criteria is your comparative starter, your use of evidence, your identification of technique and method and the detail of your analysis. So use these these ideas or completely choose your own, but it's now up to you to find your evidence, identify your techniques and write your comparative paragraphs for the rest of this lesson. Please do hand those paragraphs in with your name on at the end of the lesson. Thank you.